But my message today is entitled, Don't Take the Bait. And I want to start by saying, you know, what is at the core of sin? What is at the core of sin? Why, why, what, what makes us want to sin? There has to be something inside that, that makes us want to, or, or, or we want to go the opposite way. We want to go against the grain. But what is at the core of sin? And that's kind of where I want to start today, and we want to start this message. And the answer is pretty simple. Pride. It, it, pride is at the core of sin. Selfishness, ego, our ego, our pride. At the garden, when God told Adam, you may eat of anything in here, of every fruit, of anything, any tree, except for this tree and that tree. You have to stay away from those. But then, eventually, Eve took of the apple. She took a bite. Well, we don't know if it's an apple. It's a fruit. We're going to say fruit because we don't know if it's an apple. Um, she took a bite out of the fruit, and then she committed a sin. But it was the pride. It was the devil didn't make her do it. He just said, hey, God, if you want to be like God, if you want to know it all, go ahead and do it. But the disobedience, but in the sin was disobedience to God. God said, don't do it. They decided to do it. They disobeyed. That's the sin they committed. But it all had to do with pride. They go, whoa, man, if she's, if the serpent, which is kind of weird, is telling me to do this, then I want to do this. And here's Adam watching Eve bite of this fruit. And then he could have said, whoa, you did something wrong. Let's go talk to God and let's go repent and get our, get get everything straight away. No, he goes, you know what, man, I want to take that fruit too. And And then he took that bait as well. But pride in trying to gain the knowledge because that's what Satan did as well, right? When it, when it was time, he says, I want to be like God. I want to be better than God. So Satan was cast down as well because it all had to do with pride. It all had to do with me, my own selfish desires, what I want when I want it. King David is another example. He was ruling the kingdom. He had it all. God had appointed him, chosen him to be king of Israel and Judah. And then later on, he notices a woman bathing and he, and he, and his pride lusted over her and says, I want her to come to me. And then he ended up having sex with her and they had a kid. And then the prophet went to, to David and he says, you know what? Because if you sin that you committed now your family from now on will be in turmoil. What you, did in, what you did in secret, they will do it in public. Your family, your kids are going to be in turmoil. And what was the, no, even in the Bible says, even though God forgave him because he repented of his sin, he still had to suffer the consequences. And what was that consequence? His son or his son, you know, his kid passed away, died. He says, you're, you're going to lose your son. Even though he pleaded, he fasted, he prayed, Lord, please don't take him away. It was my fault. I apologize. God says, I forgive you. I forgive you. But there are still consequences. And from now on, your family will be in turmoil. And that's what happened. We see of Absalom, one of his sons, that took over the kingdom. He tried to kill him. He was trying to do everything better than his, than his dad. And he was more, he was worse, and he was living in sin. And it just continued to go on and on, and he started hiding. But it all started with pride. Have you ever realized that when we are living in sin, sometimes sin takes you further than you want to go? Sometimes it's hard to stop, because once you start it, you just go, man, I'm already, deep, I'm already dipped deep, I already did it, might as well continue to go. And sometimes it keeps you there longer than you want to stay as well. See, sin is this, is this cycle that just continues to go. So, like I was talking about last week, we have to kill it in order to try to be delivered for that. But sometimes sin takes you further than you want to go. And once you get there, sometimes it's just you are too far into it that, yes, even though you ask for repentance and God forgives you, there's consequences. There's things that are already placed in motion that were going to happen. Now, can God remove that from you? Absolutely. But sometimes life is life. And there are certain things that will happen. 
So that's you know that's so that's one of the questions that I posted on Facebook is that why are so many Christians constantly taking the bait of sin? We know the truth. But sometimes we get caught up into it and we don't acknowledge it and, and then sooner we realize that we're into it. And and Satan because Satan can make you do it. He can. He has no power over you. He could just deceive deceive you. And he just could just turn the the the, the truth. You could just bend it just enough to cause you to stumble. And then you don't realize it. And then when you're in it, because sometimes when we're not in con- constant connection with the Holy Spirit, which is who gives you that that they you know that 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 acknowledgement, that discernment to do what's right. And, and if you're not in there, if you're not in connection, then you take that bait. And then when you realize it, some, then shame sits in. And you start feeling shameful and 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 and, and sad. He's like, man, I can't believe I I I let, you know, I, I, I took the bait again and I'm not going to go to church now. Now I'm a bad person and all these negative thoughts, thoughts are coming in to you. I'm telling you, stop all that. Stop all that. Just repent, get up, ask for forgiveness and move on. But then what does the, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say when he was healing people? When he was, when he was changing them, just like the woman at the well or the, or the woman that the Pharisees brought and says, Jesus, what would you do? She was caught, she was caught in the very act of, 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 you know, of, of having sexual immorality, what what would he, what would you do? And then when he when everyone left because they said, hey, whoever has not sinned, cast the first stone. And everybody started leaving, right? And at the end, he told her, okay, your sins have been forgiven, but go and sin no more, right? That's the difference, right? So when if we fall, because we all are going to fall, we are not perfect. But when we do, the difference is now is that we should be able to recognize it right away so we don't fall. And if we do take that bait, we could return, we could turn away from it quickly and say, ask for forgiveness and move on, right? So now as Christians, we should have that understanding and that acknowledgement if we are living by faith. Once again, faith means allegiance. Faith means all in, all out, for, sold out for Jesus Christ. And when we are, the Holy Spirit is inside of us, then he could discern and give us a discernment that we're looking for. Because without the Holy Spirit, man, we are just driving blind. We need the Holy Spirit inside of us to deter us from some of the decisions that we're going to make. Because if we do it on our own, sometimes we're always, we're always going to screw up. You know, uh, that's why we need Jesus in our life. Amen. Don't take the bait. We have to understand that the devil, all he wants to do is to destroy you. He doesn't just want to deceive you and try and, and for you just to live a life of sin. Yeah, he's going to excited about that. But his ultimate goal is to destroy you, to pull you away from Jesus Christ. He wants to just, he's not just going to let you just mess up once. He's going to just continue to attack you and attack you and attack you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy me. So we need to be in constant connection with Jesus Christ. We need to be able to de- recognize the traps of the enemy. Don't sin any longer. Don't take the bait. Be in constant prayer. Be in constant prayer so you can recognize it. Now, why are we being constantly attacked? That's my next question. The first reason is because we are living for Christ, amen? If Because we are living for Christ, guess what? We have a bigger target. When we were living, if we were living in the world and we were being sinful, the devil didn't mess with you. He didn't have to worry about it. You were already... You were, you were there. But as soon as you decided to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, a target just got bigger on you. So now Satan's, okay, that person's not doing what I want him to do. I need to attack him. I need to make him miserable. The other reason is because we live in a sinful world. We just live in a sinful world. We have to accept it. Jesus says, they're going to hate you because you're my followers. At the end of time, they're going to hate you. You might have to die for this gospel. That's where it says to take up your cross and make sure you are, when you do it, that there is going to be consequences because the devil is not going to be happy. We live in a sinful world. And three, the devil is our enemy. The devil is our enemy. That's the reason why we're being attacked. See, sometimes we think just because we were saved and we became Christians that everything's covered and we don't have to worry about it. We're going to have a perfect life and everything's going to be good. And, and you know what? And it's not true. Now, inside your home, 
where, where, where you're safe and there's a hedge of protection and there's prayer and, and, and Jesus is living there, you can have peace and rest and joy and enjoy life. But when you go outside those doors, when we go outside these walls and we go into the world, it's a sinful world. We might suffer from the consequences of someone else doing something bad. And, it's, and that's just life. Now, like I said, once again, God will protect us and he does more than we think we, he, he does. Sometimes we don't understand it. If you can look back into your life and see certain places or areas where you were struggling, you were going, God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. This is hard. I'm having a hard time with this. Now you can look back then when you were having those issues, you were going, man, how am I going to make it tomorrow? Now we can look back and say, man, I actually made it through that. Why was I stressing so much? Or why was I struggling? Why was I complaining? Why was I arguing? Why was I going, God, where are you? Now you can look back and say, man, I actually made it through that. Back then we weren't thinking that way. But now we can look back and say, hey, we got through it. And now we understand as to why. But we need to understand that the devil, all he wants to do is to destroy you. Look at 1 Peter 5.8. And this is where he's telling us. It says, stay alert. In other words, don't, don't, don't take your eyes off the enemy. Don't think just because you made it or you won the race that it's, you're, you're all good. It says, always, stay alert. It says, watch out for the great enemy. I, I believe the King James Bible, or, some, or maybe the NIV says, be of sober mind. Sober mind. And I'll talk to you about more about being sober. Uh, it says, the great enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a, like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. I am telling you, nothing brings more joy to the devil than to get you in his trap, to get you to take the bait. Because if he can make you to feel shameful and, you know, and, and ashamed and, and make you think that other people are thinking the same way because you fell, because you, you, know, you, get, you took the bait. If he can get you in that state of mind, then man, you're just praising, he, he, you're giving him some excitement. Don't allow the devil to catch, you know, to, for him to catch you in his trap. You know, Peter urges right here to, to remain alert. To be clear-headed. See, this is one of the reasons, as, as I tell, my, tell some of my friends, you know, in the Bible, it doesn't say, it never says in the Bible that you cannot drink. You know, it doesn't say nowhere in the Bible that you cannot drink. It just says, don't be drunk. But what, but if, if me coming from the restaurant industry and, and, and taking classes in, in bar masters and bar masters or poor masters and, and understanding the ounces and, the, and all that stuff, I can guarantee you that one ounce of alcohol, it's already it already triggers your mind. There's, some, there's a feeling in there. Some people say, well, no, it takes about 10 beers for me to get drunk. Or it takes 20. It takes two. You know, people could justify all they want. But when, or even with, with, with drugs. It, whatever it is that pulls you away from, from, from thinking clearly and staying focused in God, whatever it is, that's what the devil could use. But if you are not of clear mind, if you're having something fog your mind and you can't be in constant connection with the Lord, that's when you're giving the enemy a foothold and he could go in there and attack you and you don't realize it. That's what it says to be sober in mind, to stay alert. That's what he's talking about. He urges us to be watchful because Satan is looking to attack you and he's going to continue to attack you and he will never stop until the end of times when Jesus Christ returns and he binds them for a thousand years. Then it said, the Bible says that after a thousand years, he will release him for, for a season. Then he will be tossed into the lake of fire and it'll be over and it'll be done. But the only time he'll ever stop is when he puts him in bondage, when he destroys him. But his goal right now is to continue to attack you. Revelation 20, if you want to look at that, where he says, if Jesus will bind him for a thousand years. It says, Satan may come against us like a fowler, right? Like a lion prowling. A fowler is, is someone that is setting a forceful trap. He's, in other words, he's being, in the, have you ever realized that Satan is not going to just show his face? He's not going to go, here I am and I'm going to trap you. No, he's going to do it secretly. He's going to do it deceitfully. He's going to try, like I'm saying, he's going to be like, and if you ever watch the, 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 the nation, uh, what do you call it, the Discovery Channel, if you see an, a lion that's actually hiding in the bushes and really, really slow and, and being meticulous, and then when the prey is distracted, he jumps and he tries to catch it, that's the devil. He's going to be deceitful. He's going to wait for you to make a mistake where you're distracted. That's what it says, stay alert. And as soon as he realizes it, boom, he's going to jump at you. And he's going to try to deceive you. And he's going to try to trap you. 
So he wants to lure you in his evil net. So we need to be conscious. We need to be alert. Sometimes Satan will come to you as an angel of light. Once again, he'll try to bend the truth just enough for you to believe it. And you think it's a blessing from the Lord and it's not. He's just trying to do anything he can to trap you. We have to be able to be, you know, be, be, you know, be Holy Spirit less so we could acknowledge when he's trying to do that. And then sometimes, like Peter said, he'll come at you like a roaring lion wanting to devour you. In other words, he's going to come growling and, and making this big show and making, and making this big mess up and make some big mess in your life and he's going to try to intimidate you. But we have to remember that he, all it is is a growl. He has no bite. Amen. He cannot do anything more than that. He could growl. He could make all the noises he wants. He could throw, make it feel like you're going to crash down, but he can't do more than that. There is no bite. Some, but sometimes we get intimidated because we think, oh, the devil, he's so powerful. He's going to destroy me. He can't do anything to you. We have been given all power and authority when Jesus came to this earth. He gave it to us. He took it away from the devil. He has nothing over us. So he, all he can do is try to deceive you, try to trick you, try to catch you in his trap, try to lure you with whatever bait he can, with whatever he knows that you're weak at or you're struggling with. He's going to do everything he can. And when he can't catch you some way, he'll try something else and he'll continue to try and try because he wants to destroy us. So what are we fighting? We're fighting, the Bible says that we're fighting evil rulers, authorities of unseen worlds. We're fighting mighty powers in the dark worlds. We're fighting evil spirits, evil spirits in the heavenly places. Once we committed our lives to Christ, I am telling you, there is a bigger target. There is more value in your soul. God always loved you. But now that you're following him, that the, all the devil says, man, there's, I need to get that guy. I need to get that guy. He is living for Christ. He is happy. He's excited. I don't like it. I need to attack him. I need to attack him. He is not going to be happy about that. If he can tempt you with a little, he can trap you into bigger things. Did you catch that? If he could tempt you a little bit, he's going to catch you with bigger things. We have to be careful. We have to be able to recognize the traps of the enemy. Amen. Ephesians 6. Look at this. Here it tells us exactly in verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. If you back up, this is not in my note, but if you back up in Ephesians, if you're reading from your Bible, if you go to Ephesians 10 and 11, it says what? Be strong in the Lord. Be courageous. Put on the armor of God. He's telling us before he's telling us this, you need to put on the armor of God. That's what's going to protect you. That's what's going to strengthen you. That's what's going to uphold you. This is what's going to get you through it. Because in verse 12, he's telling you, this is the reason why you have to put on the armor of God. This is why you have to be equipped with the word. Because the enemy is real and he's ready to attack and he's ready to destroy you. Before, he's, before Ephesians 12, he's telling you that Ephesians 10 and 11, he's telling you, be careful. Put on your spiritual armor because we are fighting a spiritual battle. And if you're ignoring that, then that probably means that you're not winning the battle. You are getting beat up by Satan. Don't take the bait. Put on the armor of God. When we put on the armor of God, it's like putting a, it's a repellent. It's, it's, it's blocking all the, all the fiery darts, the Bible says, that the devil tries to throw at you to destroy you. Make sure you stay connected. The word of God, our Bible, is our chief weapon. Amen? That's where we have to attack them. So where can sin take us if we are not living for God and we're living for the world? Where can sin take us? It takes us where we don't want to go. Sometimes when we're in sin and you, and you create a sin, it's going to take you someplace where you never wanted to go, where you were intended to go, but because you committed that sin, it just took you further than that. It keeps us there, like I said, longer than we want to stay. And sometimes it will cost us more than we ever want to pay. And that's the scary part. Sometimes when you're living in sin, you can lose your family over it. Sometimes you say, you know what, this sin, this lust is more important to me than my wife, than my husband, than my kids. 
I want to continue living this way because this is what I want. This is the enjoyment that I'm getting, and it's good. But that's a lie because, it, because you know what? Sin, if it feels good, it's only for a short season because then you're going to have to try to figure something else to try to get that high, whether it's spiritual or physical. You can never, ever, ever get enough. The only way you could be fulfilled, have the fulfillment inside your heart is with Jesus Christ living inside of you. And I'm not just telling you that because I'm, I'm a pastor or I believe in Jesus. It's, that's just the truth. Amen? When, when you're living for Jesus, man, he fulfills that whatever was in there that was taking you away that you thought that you needed to replace. That's what people in the world, even, you know, even you know, musicians or politicians or people that have riches, that commit suicide because they say they were lonely, they feel alone, and they can never be happy. It, does, it has nothing to do with money. I am extremely happy, and I'm extremely joyful, and I love my life, and I love living for the Lord, and I'm not the richest person. <laughs> but God fulfills my needs, and he takes care of me and my wife because we're being faithful and obedient, because we're trusting in God. Yeah, we all go through difficult times, and we, you know we've been in those places. Where, man, where we're going? How we're going to pay the rent? How we're going to do that? You know, insurance is coming due. All these things are happening. We can get so stressed out and focus on that. But why? Why are we? Why do we do that? Why do we? What's the point of it? Why stress out? Why worry? Why cry? Why get angry? It ain't going to change the situation, right? So, so that's, and that's what it talks about. If you have faith, if you have allegiance, then you trust in God. And whether he chooses to bless you right there immediately or wait 21 days, like he did, like he did with, with Isaiah when he was praying, he goes, Lord, hear my heart, hear my love, here's my prayer, help me because I'm being destroyed because I'm being attacked by the enemy. And then the angel comes and says, man, I, God heard your prayers as soon as you prayed it. But it took me 21 days to get here and tell you because the chief angel of dark, of the, of the dark world was holding me up. And so then Michael, the archangel, had to come and help me so I could be released and come and tell you that God heard your prayers. That you are just continue to be strong, continue to be faithful, continue to trust in God. Sometimes we don't understand as to why certain prayers don't get answered or take a little bit longer. Man, there's a spiritual warfare going on in this world that we don't know about. We need to understand that and we need to be alert because that's what's happening. Man, I believe that there's a constant battle for you and me right now. And the devil is trying to destroy us. There's, he's not just relaxing just because you're in church. No. There's a reason and a purpose why you're here in church today. It wasn't just coincidence. Amen. We need to get sharpened. We need to engage. We need to learn. We need to be in more obedient and try to understand that God loves us. And because he loves us, the devil hates us. Amen. Romans 6, 23, and it's not in your outline, but it says what? The wages of sin are death. The wages of sin are death. If we are living in sin, physical death is horrible, but spiritual death is worse. Amen. That's why I'm telling you, yes, I was sad when my parents passed away and I miss them dearly, but I am so thankful and I can rejoice that they accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That means more to me than, than crying and saying, man, I miss my parents. I can't do without them. My brother and my sisters don't understand that. Every time their birthday comes around or it's a holiday, they get into this depression state. And I go, man, rejoice. Think about all the good things that we had with our family. Think of all the good things that were in the past. Hold on to that when you're feeling sad. But we need to move on. Amen. And for some of us, it takes longer. It doesn't mean that I don't care or, or I'm insensitive. It's just I know who I serve. And he can fill in that sadness inside my heart that's missing from other people, right? We need, that's our source. That's our strength. But if we're not living for Christ, if we're not completely sold out, then we, I, can, I can understand why it hurts and you're sad and you fall into this depression state. You need Jesus in your life. You don't allow Satan to pull that joy away from you. Satan, sin, takes us away from God. That's what we talk about repentance. Repentance brings you back, amen? We have to repent. We have to pray. Ask for forgiveness. Move on. So how can we overcome the bait? Let me give you how. Let me give you the, the answers here as to how can we overcome this bait. And it's simple. By having a constant dialogue with God. Being in communion. Being in prayer. 
reading your word. You have to do it daily. When you wake up, the first thoughts in your mind should be, God, thank you. Amen. By reading the word of God daily, you have to be in his word. How do you build a relationship? By getting to know that person better. By being in constant dialogue. By spending time with them. By hiding God's word in your heart. Pastor Dwayne spoke about that. Engrave the word of God in your heart. So when you're going through struggles, when you feel alone, that word is right there and the devil can't rob you of that joy. And you can say, no, devil, God lives in me. You can't do anything to me. Get away from me, Satan. Then you'll flee. He has no power over you. We must give ourselves completely to God. In all, through all. We need to acknowledge and remember who we serve. We serve a mighty God, the most living high. There is no one greater than God. And he loves you and me. Equal, not more, not less. He loves us all the same. Psalm 119 says, I have hidden his word in my heart. That's where Pastor Dwayne was talking about. I have hidden his word, God's word in my heart. Sometimes we might not say the right things or know what to do in certain situations. But God, the Holy Spirit, because you hid his word in his heart, will give you the right words to say at certain times. Well, well you will wonder, how, did I was able, how was I able to say that or do that? Or what, what happened? It's because it's the Holy Spirit in you. He will give you the right words to say at the right time. He will direct your path. But you have to stay connected to the word. You have to stay connected to Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't take debate. Aggressively hide God's word in your heart. Amen. Aggressively. Look at John 16. This is powerful. Verse 33 says, I have told all of all this so that you may have peace in me. This is Jesus speaking. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. I want you to remember that word may. May. Okay. And it says, here on earth you will. And may and will. Two different words right there. You will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have what? I have overcome the world. See, here Jesus is saying, you may have peace. And then he's saying, you will have many trials. There's a difference, the may and the will. He's not saying that you will, that you will always have peace. See, peace is offered to us. Peace is offered. There's a difference. Trials, that's a promise. <laughs> that's a promise. If, you're, if, you're, if, I, if I'm looking at it, it's, you know what? May means to me that it's offered. It's there if I want it. If I'm living for God, if I'm living by the word, if I'm following his commands, if I'm doing what he's telling me to do, I may have peace. But he's promised me, but he's promising that here on earth, because it's a sinful world, you're going to have many trials. That's a promise. So the only way we could overcome that, so we don't fall into sorrow, so we don't fall into shame, so we don't feel distressed, so we don't feel hurt and brokenhearted, is what? To believe and trust in what he's saying, that he has overcome the world. So he says, don't stay there. Don't stay there. Yeah, you're going to go through it. You're going to go through it. But remember that I already overcame it. And I am your deliverer. Continue to stay faithful to me. Trust and obey. Have faith. Have allegiance to me. I have overcame the world in my life, in my death, in my resurrection. So have peace. Find peace in me. Amen. That is a powerful statement. See, once again, we think because we're Christians that we, everything's perfect and fine. And it may be more times than it was when you were in the sinful world. It's that you weren't able to acknowledge it because were, we were living in sin. We didn't think of it. But now that we know the truth, man, we wonder, like, wow, wow, I mean, I'm being, it's harder now that I'm a Christian. <laughs> it's hard. My brother used to say, it's hard to be a Christian. I go, what are you talking about? It's just that you're still not trying to let, you, you don't want to let go of your past. You're still trying to live both lives. You can't. Once again, we talked about it, right? Don't ride the fence. The devil owns the fence. Romans 6, 13, do not let, here's the powerful, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil. Any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin, to serve the devil. Instead, what to say? Give yourself completely to God. 
give yourself completely to God for you were dead, but now you have a new life, right? So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Man, that is powerful. So he's saying we must not present any parts of our body to the service of our sin, our mouth, our eyes, our lips, our hands, our mind, whatever it is. So if we have eyes, don't put them to the service of sin if you're struggling with pornography. That's what it's talking about. If you have a problem with stealing in your past life when you were committing sins and you were constantly stealing things, don't put your hands in the service of sin. Don't put your hands in the service of sin if you have a problem with stealing. If you have a problem with gossip, don't put them in the service. Don't put your lips in the service of sin. Don't use, it says, don't use any parts of your body to be an instrument of evil. You can't be here praising the Lord and then trying to take something away. That's what it's talking about. All your body, everything you have, your heart, your mind, your soul, your entire body, put it for an instrument to do good for the glory of God. Amen. If you're struggling in certain areas, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't put them in the service of sin. God's grace is freedom. Amen. God's grace is freedom. God's grace is sufficient. When we feel alone, God's grace is sufficient. When we feel ashamed, God's grace is sufficient. When you're stuck in bondage, when you're stuck in bondage, God's grace is sufficient. But if we what is uh, John says, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, right? And, and to cleanse us from every wickedness. That's what the Bible says in 1 John. God's grace is sufficient. God will never quit loving us. He will never quit loving us. Man, aren't you thankful for that? <laughs> I am. He loves us right now the way you are right now. And if you want to change right now, he's willing to accept you just the way you are just the way you are right now. You don't have to change anything. He'll accept you right now, right here, just the way you are because he loves you that much. And he loves you that much so he doesn't want to leave you where you're at. He wants you to grow in him. Start this relationship. That's what what I'm telling you. This church has been praying for the past year and we've been really just focusing on prayer. Because that's what we believe is so important. Sometimes we missed it. That we should have been praying more. In constant prayer. A fervent prayer. And you'll hear Pastor Pete. He leaves this Wednesday for Korea. And you know what he's most excited about? He's saying, man, when I get there, I'm going straight to the prayer chapel to pray. (laughs) Man, you're going to arrive there at four in the morning. Man, but he goes, I'm going to go to prayer. I'm going to start. And he's just specifically going just to pray this time. He just wants to seek Lord and thank him for the, the faithfulness and, the, and, and everything that he's been doing in our church, in our churches and in our life. Amen. He's excited. He's so excited. The Bible talks about putting all our sins at the cross, leaving our sins at the altar. You know, and when we walk, in faith, and we lay all our sins at the altar, it's going to cost us something. Sometimes, sometimes it might cost you your pride because you're saying, man, I'm not going to walk up there and, 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 and nail my sins at the cross. And I'm just talking about a spiritual altar. Sometimes we don't want to take that step. It might cost us our, our pridefulness. It may cost you to, to swallow your pride. But the Bible says you need to nail your sins at the cross. You need to ask for forgiveness. It needs to come out. You need to, you need to profess. It needs to come out of your mouth. We can't just Velcro our sins at the cross. You know why? Because you know if we Velcro them, we could easily take them back. We have to nail it. We have to kill it at the cross. We have to believe that Jesus Christ died for you and for me and for all our sins, past, present, and future. Amen. Nail your sins at the cross. Nail your sins of lust 
of doubt, selfishness, jealousy, anger, pride, hurts, addictions, whatever the sin is. It could be anything, anything that's pulling you away from God's love. Anything. I'm just here naming a few. And I'm not saying this is what you're struggling with, but this is what I'm just kind of talking about. Jesus came to this world to deliver us from sin. So he's saying, man, I, you've, you, I've overcome the world. You've accepted me as your personal Lord and Savior. Now just nail your sins at the cross because you are forgiven. Don't just Velcro them. Don't take them back. It's done. It is finished. I did it all. I paid the price for you. My blood was sufficient. Amen. Do you believe that? Don't take the bait. Amen. That's the message today. Don't take the bait. So in closing, let me, let me close with this. Do any of you come up front? Don't take the bait of sin, church. Instead, let's cast our own baits to catch people for Christ. Amen. Let's cast our own baits. Let's try to beat the devil in his own game. Let's set our own traps in a good way, I guess you could say, to catch people for Jesus. Let's be warriors of Jesus, not warriors. We shouldn't be worrying too much. We should be a warrior. Let us be water walkers. Amen. Let us be a God-fearing church. Let us have this iron faith inside of us that the devil cannot easily penetrate, that he's going to have a hard time. Let him get frustrated. I, I posted something on Facebook. I said, you know what? I want to continue to pray so much and fervently that I want the devil to pray for the, for, 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 uh, for, uh, I put that, uh, the tri that rapture to happen, for the rapture to happen. I want the devil to be so afraid that he, I want him to pray for the rapture. Because that's how I'm firing for the Lord. That's how I believe that we're living in the last days and we want to commitly sell our life to Jesus. We want to walk by faith. We want to be this iron faith walker. Amen. That is not easily distracted by the devil's schemes. We need to be able to recognize it. So the way we can recognize it is by being in constant dialogue with Jesus. Amen. Pick up your word. Be in a relationship with him because God loves you and he wants you to be in the perfect relationship with him. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for just loving me loving me the way that I am thank you for accepting me just as I am but now that I believe in you and I completely sold out to you continue to strengthen me continue to encourage me continue to give me the right words to say continue to put me in the path that you want me to walk in continue to Allow me to be able to recognize the traps of the enemy. Give me the discernment that only comes from your Holy Spirit. Lord, I love you. And I want more of you. And I want you to be proud of me. Even when I fall. Lord Jesus, that I'm able to recognize it, stand up, shake it off, and continue to walk. And you will love me just the same. Father God, just give me the desire in my heart to know you more, to grow more in you, ignite that fire in my heart, to continue to search and get excited when I read your word, when the very words of the Bible come alive in my life. Father God, we thank you for that. Father God, we ask you, you protect Pastor Pete and John as they go to Korea. Father God, we pray traveling mercies for them. Father God, but when they're there, just continue to give them that hunger for you, O oh Lord. As they're praying, pray, as they're praying 12 hours a day for our church, for me, and for our people, for our, for our family, Father God. As they're praying for us, O oh Lord Jesus. Father God, give us that hunger to want more of you, to desire more of you. Father God, we thank you for the many blessings that you are doing in our church, O oh Father God. This Friday, Lord, we were able to help over 14 families with food. And it's only through you, O oh Lord. Man, what an awesome privilege to do the works of you, Father God. To work for you, O oh Lord Jesus. We do it with gladness and happiness and joy in our lives. 
because it's all about what we can do for you because we love you. And we thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. And everyone said, amen and amen.